It's, it's been quite a while since May, hasn't it, when, we, when you had this idea. We had an idea of doing another Bible study. And so it was in May we met and we uh, talked about, hey, what do you want to do next year? And I was kind of like, well, I don't feel God's you know, really telling me to do that much. As in, I don't feel a great calling to, to teach. But the last three years, we've done Journey Through John, three years ago, Journey Through Hebrews, and Journey Through Matthew last year. So when we talked about, well, what about Genesis? I'm like, yeah, that's, that's a good book. That's, that's, that's long. That's going to take us a while, maybe two years, right? No, I'm kidding. Not, it's not going to take us two years, but it's going to take us nine months. But I'm taking it night by night, right? I'm going to take this semester by semester, week by week. So I'm here tonight. I'm teaching next week. And, and then another pastor is teaching the third week, and we'll, we will rotate. Um, I'm excited because we're going to teach through God's Word, right? We're going to look at God's Word, hopefully in depth, sometimes with stories, sometimes with parables. Hey, we know someone that taught through parables, right? A lot of stories. So um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. As you can tell, I'm not from around these parts, right? So uh, I do speak North Carolinian now. I say y'all, and I eat biscuits, uh, which you know are cookies to me. But I, eat, you know, I eat them. I eat sweet tea. I drink sweet tea. I still drink hot tea, but now I drink sweet tea, which was like when the first time I came here, I thought, "Where's the tea gonna go? You've got all this ice in there. I mean, there's nowhere to put the water." Uh, anyway, so I'm pretty acclimatized now. I've been here for 16 years in the states. I'm a, I'm a naturalized person here. I live here, I've got a wife here, I've got a son, um, and, and I'm just so pleased to be here. I'm just so thankful that we've got a place to meet as well. Um, you know, some parts of the world, as you know, have nowhere at the moment. So let's just thank God. Lord, we thank you, don't we, God? We thank you for bringing us here. Lord, your, your word says to rejoice always, right? So whatever you've come here with tonight, rejoice, right? Rejoice that we're here. Okay, be ready to start. All right. So, um, you know, the famous line, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So that's where we're going to start tonight. But first, um, let me get my little machine working here. Let me go back one. Okay, so this has been my desktop screensaver. I changed it about two months back. And so on my computer, I've looked at this for two months. So Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. So that's where we're starting this Bible study. Jesus is the foundation of what we're learning. Now, this picture is a little bit wrong, isn't it? Because the cornerstone should be at the bottom. But this was such a good photo. So it's not quite correct. So imagine this big block needs to be the corner at the bottom. And if you've ever seen photos of Jerusalem underneath Jerusalem, they have blocks of stone that I'm not kidding you are the size of this wall that were brought in by, by uh, the kings. And they were chiseled and they are huge. And they are cornerstones, they are dressed rock they have to be perfect because everything from the cornerstone builds outwards both ways and upwards because god has made this world so amazing if you hang a plumb line a weight on a piece of string off this ceiling it will hang perfectly vertical the reason is 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 that gravity doesn't change gravity pulls that that piece of string down and you could build a wall up against that and keep going on and on and on in the perfect world but we have wind and that would eventually blow it but you could build a wall straight up from a hanging piece of uh, rope and it would be perfectly straight so our plumb line is Jesus our plumb line is the Word of God right this is what we have to build on and Jesus is our cornerstone so we're going to start off looking at him. Firstly, though, I want to talk about something um, about navigation. This is the north face of Ben Nevis, and I have spent many days climbing here in my youth. Uh, this is it in winter, obviously. The summit is over there where the cloud is. 
and people actually enjoy going here for vacation and climbing up these up these ridges people climb up this ridge here tower ridge and up Orion's face incredibly dangerous stuff but when you get to the summit up here you see those clouds on a nice day like this there's no problem getting off the mountain you just walk off the other side the other side is like a, a hill but this is the north face but if it's cloudy weather at the summit you can walk off the cliff can you see that if you're at the summit and you walk the wrong way you could walk off and fall 2,000 feet so navigation is vital we have at the moment I think going on in our society for the last 100 150 years a lot of false stuff right and people are starting to believe all kinds of false things fables the Bible calls it doctrines that are not quite accurate you know UFOs and 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 I think evolution is one of those do you realize that, that, that Darwinism at the moment is really under attack from the intellectuals? They are beginning to realize, the real scientists, that it actually doesn't work mathematically and biologically. They, they are saying it, it, cannot, it could not happen. It cannot happen. It's a mathematical impossibility, which we'll talk about. But if you want to get off this mountain, you have to at the summit and it looks a bit odd this is a map right so when you get to the summit of ben nevis you have to be able to navigate off this piece of rock with a compass has anyone seen it anyone ever seen anything like this like a little compass all right that's a compass and you use that to navigate and you have to walk from the summit for 150 meters on bearing 231 which is about 89 double steps so one two three you have to do 89 steps if it's a complete whiteout you can't see anything you have to trust your compass so you set your compass and you cannot see a single thing and you set your compass and you follow it for 89 steps perfectly because if you get it wrong you will fall off the mountain if you go beyond 89 steps you end up over here back in danger again so after 89 steps you have to stop take another compass bearing change your compass and go off in a different direction you are just trusting your compass and I believe that in this analogy your Bible is your compass right this is what's going to keep us from error right and with the Holy Spirit guiding us he will navigate us around the cliffs the false teaching the dangers um, going off too far right so we have to come back to God's Word every every day we have to come back we have to reassess what we believe I myself have had to remove things from my own um, my own self that I've picked up as a Christian that were actually that that's really not accurate I remember one where I deliberately believed not to believe the Word of God I still remember the day I said no I'm not going to believe that and I went off for 15 years believing something else and so when God brought me back to the truth I remember where I was on the side of the road when I made a conscious decision to believe something other than what the Bible said right so we can all get it wrong all of us and we have to continuously readjust our compass readjust am I on track am I walking the right way have I got it right and we do that by community like this bouncing ideas off one another hearing what other people say we do it by the Bible and we do it by the Holy Spirit okay so is this walk dangerous what do you think I see a few people nodding I think it's dangerous I think I think you can fall off the cliff right we know people in the news right that have fallen off they have started to believe odd things and they've fallen off so we have to come back to God's Word and that's what we're gonna do eternity is a funny place eternity I, I thought this summer is a whole different time zone 
right? When I traveled to Europe this summer, it was six hours, a different time zone. But eternity is a different time zone. And God is in eternity. And he knows your tomorrow. In many ways, he's already been to your tomorrow. How does he do that? Because he's in eternity and he's able to go into time, which is where we are now, and out of time, right? But we're stuck in time, aren't we? We're in time. So let's go and read some scripture. Let's go to John chapter 1. Now, if you don't have a Bible, you can just sit there and listen to my English accent and uh, be blessed. So John chapter 1, we're going to read a few verses. The scripture says, um, Paul said, I think it was Paul or Timothy, um, said, give yourselves to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and teaching. So we're going to do that. We're going to do the public reading of scripture. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. So that's Jesus Christ. He is the light, right? And he is the word. He's the Word of God. Whenever you read about the Word of God in the Old Testament, now this is a big step for some of us, you're talking about Jesus. When the Word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, who is it? It's Messiah. And in Jeremiah chapter 1, it says the Word of the Lord touched Jeremiah's mouth. Now, that takes a hand to touch and that's before Jesus was born. So the Word of God has always existed. So where are we? Verse 10, is it? He was in the world, and, through the, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He, Christ, came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, He gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh. Right? The Word that we read in the Old Testament became man, just like us, took on body, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So here is our cornerstone. This is what we're going to start this journey on is Jesus Christ, right? He is the Word of God, and He is what we're going to build on through this study. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Let's go to Genesis 1 then. Let's actually start. As we go through Genesis, you will read, as we go through this study of people in Genesis meeting the Word of God, right? And it's, it's wild. How can the Word of God be present in Genesis before he's been born of Mary? Well, he's in eternity. It's a different time zone. He can come out of eternity and reveal himself and go back to eternity. Angels, I believe, can do that. We can't at the moment. I think we'd probably spontaneously combust if we tried to do that or something, right? We, we can't do it. We're not built for that. But you will see this as God reveals himself to man through Genesis. So we started off with eternity. So let's read Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. From my understanding, time had not been created at this point. Right? There was creation, the heavens and the earth. So the heavens were made. Well, what's in the heavens? At this point, I think it's God's uh, angelic realm. Or, or maybe the universe. But then we read in Genesis, you know, a little bit further down in Genesis tonight, it's God creates the stars. So God creates the heavens, this, this place. Um, so it's in eternity, and the angels are there with God. So Satan had not fallen at this point. We will, we will understand that tonight. He had not fallen. He was there with the angels in eternity. So that's a long time. Eternity is a different place. It's a different time zone. <laughs> it's hard to understand. I think sometimes I can, I, I can understand eternity sometimes if I'm looking at something pretty. So uh, a pretty flower or a beautiful sunset. I feel sometimes I get a glimpse of eternity. It's fleeting, right? You, you, you touch something that's yearning inside you, as Ecclesiastes says. God has put eternity into us. We all know this feeling. Oh, I want to. There's something more than the hurricanes and the pain and the suffering of this world, right? There's, there's an eternal place. So verse 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Oh, I'm pressing the wrong button. That will help, won't it? There we go. So there's the Spirit of God. We've just heard about the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So before time was created, the Spirit of God is hovering. He's hovering over the waters. The earth was completely covered in water. From my understanding, it was completely covered in water. Right? We read this in the New Testament. Out of water, God formed uh, the substance of, of, of the world. So even in these first few verses, you see... The, the, the Trinitarian God. You see God the Father, you see the Word, and you see the Holy Spirit. If you want to see it, you can see the different parts of God that we know as Christians is the Trinity, the three parts. So here we have the first day, the first 24-hour light cycle. I think this is highly important to understand this. God repeats this, I think it's six times in Genesis chapter 1, the first day, the second day, and there was evening and there was morning the third day, and there was evening and there was morning the fifth day, and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Now God is kind of like, I think, knocking on us, thankfully showing me that this is a 24-hour life cycle. This is a 24-hour period. I don't believe it's millions of years. I believe it's very plainly 24 hours. Right? Anyone else believe that? If you're struggling with that, that's okay. Right? God has given us free will to choose. I can choose to do something and I can choose not to. You all have that choice. You chose to come here tonight. And no one forced you to come here, right? I mean, maybe one or two, maybe your wives said, come on. Um, but ultimately, it's a free will choice whether you believe, whether we believe the scriptures or not. Um, this is interesting that it's always the evening and the morning, the first day. This is the Hebrewic day. This helps us understand why Jesus rose on the third day. And you go, well, hang on, it's only two days. Mm -mm. No, if you know the Hebrew, the Hebrew day starts at evening. Sundown is the start of the day. We kind of say, well, the sun up is the start of the day. But Hebrew, it's the other way around. Hebrew, it's sundown. And so when Jesus died... Before sundown, that was one day. Then there was the second day he was in the grave. And then he rose on the third day. So it is three Hebrew days. So it's important. The second thing God did was he created uh, the atmosphere, the sky, and the sea. He separated out uh, these two divisions. What God is doing here is he's, he's putting large scaffolding in place. So just by Triangle Town Centre, they've been building a 
set of condominiums, Piedmont, I think it's called, for about nine months. And you can literally see them putting in the foundations. They're clearing the ground. And then they put up the, the frames of the building. And at the moment, they've all got wood, and some have got that white paper stuff on them that keeps out the, the moisture. Right, these big buildings. Well, this is what God's doing here. He's, he, he's, he's building big parts of the universe. And then as we go through the days, then he starts populating them. In the same way, in maybe two months' time, these houses just up the road will have windows in them, and then they'll get painted, and then they'll get plumbing, and then they'll get toilets, and then they'll get kitchens. Well, that's the fine detail. On the third day, he created the land, the plants, the trees. So let's read that. So what is that? Verse 9. I'll start at verse 9. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and land, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. So God is speaking the plants into existence. Let there be. Boom. And they, they appear. He's not making them with his hands at this point. He's speaking them. It's creative with his voice. The land produced vegetation plants bearing seed according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. Right? This is all good. Okay? So there we have it. The plants the land, the sea. Out of the plants come all the other plants, right? These are photos from a garden in England, I believe, where I visited this summer. I mean, look at the beauty, the beauty in these plants, the complexity, the mathematics of each of the petals, just beautiful stuff. Uh, these are Tasmanian tree ferns. They, they reckon, they, no, it's not reckon, they found these in fossils. This is a really old plant. It's, it's managed to survive. Um, we have gardens all over the world. They're beautiful, right? Beautiful gardens. What day are we on here? Day four. Let's get to that. Uh, so verse 14, And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years, and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. So God separates the, the darkness and the light. So on day one, he created light and darkness. But there wasn't the sun and the moon at that point. So what was the light? But he made light. And he made darkness. And he said it was good. I was out last night walking my dog, and, and the, the darkness came down as the night went down. And as it got darker, the moon got brighter and brighter. The stars got prettier and prettier. There's a purpose to the darkness. And it was good. Right? So the darkness allows us to see the light. So God created that. I mean, it goes back to one uh, John, right? It goes back to the light. Okay? This is the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, scientists tell us it's 2.5 million light years away. So if you were to travel at the speed of light, which Einstein says is impossible, because it takes infinite amount of power to get there, it would take you 2.5 million light years. It's huge. And this is just a this is not that far away. <laughs> it's just amazing, the universe that God's made. If we were to zoom in on one section of this, you could kind of keep zooming in and zooming in, and you'd see more and more stars. You'd see more and more. NASA is about to launch uh, their upgrade to the Hubble telescope, which um, I'm sure most of, most of us have heard about. They say it's going to be seven times as powerful as Hubble. Well, Hubble gave us views like this. So the next satellite is going to see even more. 
It's going gonna, it's gonna to show even more of the galaxy of what God created. It goes on and on and on. This is, this is the world that God created. This, this shows his, you know, how do we understand God's intellect? How do we understand who he is? You know, um, when we get to the animals in a few more slides, I was watching a video yesterday of three of America's, you know, three brilliant scientists in America. And they said that, they, they, they were saying, well, Darwin really didn't, Darwin kind of did a, a reasonable job. One of them said he did a great job, and one of them said not, not so great. But they made a point. The, the point is Darwin thought the cell was quite simple. Okay, he thought the cell was simple. The scientists of today now say the cell is extremely complex. And Darwin didn't get that. He didn't understand that from what they said. The cell in your body, and you, we have trillions of cells in our body, each cell is incredibly complex and scientists are baffled by the complexity of it there's machines within machines within the cell doing jobs which just you know are just extraordinary all right day five so we have the stars created the moons created and god said verse 19 and there was morning that there was evening and there was morning the fourth day uh, verse 20, and God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let the birds fly across the earth, across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. So God's going ballistic here. I mean, he's just creating dolphins and seals and penguins and, and flying birds and sparrows and hawks and eagles. And I mean, he's just, he's just throwing paint on the wall, if you will, and you know, throwing the clay down and just building these extraordinary creatures, right? Just amazing. Uh, and God, verse 22, and God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the water in the seas. Let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. Um, we had a tree cut down on, on our property and they cut it down to, you know, the stump. Well, within two months, that stump has sprouted all this green stuff. All, the, all these um, sprigates have come out of this tree which we cut down. The, the tree is the cut down tree is doing what God says in Genesis keep growing multiply and so even when you cut the plant down it will try and grow again we have these oak trees in England that were like um, some of them I think are 800 years old these old English oaks and they get damaged in storms and you know limbs get ripped off them in you know gales and and stuff but they keep going right they keep growing there's a the, there's a parable there for us when we have trouble in life you know your limb gets ripped off your life off you keep going you know God's put this in us to keep living you know keep going until he calls you home don't give up because the the plants show us what to do keep going I've seen trees that have fallen down and they start growing upwards again you know the whole tree is down but they then change direction and the plant that the, 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 the branches go up so keep going don't give up Verse 24, and God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, uh, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals. So there are three types of animals here that God created. Don't believe the lie that sheep have evolved from, say, something else. No, sheep and cattle and goats are livestock. They were made to be farmed, right? They're livestock. Then you have the creatures on the ground, I don't know, little moles and voles. Well, we don't farm moles and little creatures like that. Then we have the wild animals, right? The lions. I mean, I don't want to tame a lion, do you? Can you imagine keeping a flock of lions? It doesn't work. They're different creatures. They're not, they're not, they're not made for that. Does anyone know what kind of uh, eagle that is? That's a golden eagle. You'll find that in, in Ezekiel, I think it is, that one of the angels has a face of a golden eagle. He has four faces, a face of a lion, a face of an ox, a face of a man, and a face of an eagle. This is what God created. There are creatures in heaven that are just wild. 
I mean, it's, no, it's not surprising when some of the people in the Bible meet an angel, they fall down as dead. I mean, if you met something that had a four faces of four different creatures, what would you do? I mean, I would, I would go, what is going on? That's what the people in the Bible did, you know? And this is why the angels often said, do not fear. Because most of us are, you know, pretty scared. Isn't that cute? That is a, it's called a quokka. It lives on an island off Australia. It's a marsupial, so it carries its baby in its little pouch here. A quokka. And yes, they really do look that cute. They've got little happy smiley faces. So God made those, the little creatures. And then he made us. I've gone on a bit, haven't I? I've got to like the sixth day there. All right, let's go forward. Where are we? Uh, verse 26, then God said, let us make... Oh, here we go. God said, let us. Us? What's that about? I thought God was one. But he's saying us, plural. Let us make man in our image in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky and over livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground so god created mankind in his own in it, image in the image of god he created them male and female he created them god blessed them and said to them be fruitful and increase in number fill the earth and subdue it rule over the fish of the sea the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground then God said I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it they will be yours for food and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground everything that has the breath of life in it I give every green plant for food and it was so God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. So we have a change from just good, right? The eagles were good. I mean, this is good stuff. The plants were good. Now we get to man, it's very good, right? You and I were originally very good. I think that has an impact today on how God views us, right? He loves us because we're his special creation. We are very good. God saw all that he had made and it was very good and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So God made mankind. He made us male and female. If you haven't noticed, it looks a bit like me, right? All right so that's me and my wife when we were in our younger days. Um, and, and we're male and female. I, I have attributes that my wife doesn't have. And we're going to read about this in the next chapter. This is important. This is, this is going back to your compass bearing again. What does the Word of God say about us? Right? What direction are we on in life? Can anyone tell me, does the man have the XX chromosome or the XY chromosome? XY? Have I got that right? Okay, good. So I, I have XY chromosome, my wife is XX. That, that at this point in the story was perfect. Our DNA as Adam and Eve was, was just wonderful, right? The DNA within us, the building blocks within us, right? And we were very good. Adam and Eve were very good. All right, so chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast, vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, God rested from his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all the work of creating he had done. I think I had one more photo in there that's... Uh, oh yeah, if I keep going. So I was just trying to say here, um, you know, this is me in Africa two, about two years ago. We're all related to Adam right we all go back to Adam I still find that difficult to believe okay so if, you, if you're finding that hard sitting here I find that hard too but it's like I believe it right that I was I'm actually and you are related to Adam and Eve the first man and first woman it's not just a story this is fact 
Um, there's a scientist in England uh, who did a study during his vacations. He went around England and he, he took DNA samples while he was on vacation and he was expecting to find there to be hundreds of families around England going back, you know, a uh, thousand years. And what he found, you know, was different from what he set out. He found that um, the English DNA can go back to about eight different families. It blew him away. It wasn't m many, many families. It was about eight sets of DNA or something like that. So this is how we can see that we do go back to Adam and Eve. Okay, so God has the Sabbath rest. This is my son resting in Scotland. Who would like to sit there with a book? Yeah, God answered my prayer and got me a place to sit this summer with nice sunsets. So pray. God answers our prayers. So God rested on the Sabbath day. This is important to rest. Take time out. God did it. We need to do it. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. All right, let's get into the last 10 minutes. Let's get into um, Adam and Eve. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when, God, when they were created, when the Lord God made earth and the heavens. Now, no shrub had yet appeared on the earth. So I'm in chapter, chapter 2, verse 5. No plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. So God takes dust, right? Dust. Not stardust. Not new agey stuff. No, we're made of dirt. Right? We're man. Uh, the Hebrew there for ground is Adama. Man is Adam. We come. Adam came from Adama. Adam came from the ground. That's why we can't stand in front of angels often. We're not strong enough. <laughs> we just fall over. That's why Jesus had to leave his glory behind. Because you read in Revelations, he has you know, eyes like flames of fire. I mean, it's, 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 he left his glory and became man so that he could meet us. Uh, so, so God took the clay. I, I've often wondered whether he spat in it you know, and made the clay you know because Jesus did that the miracle with the man that was blind Jesus took the dirt and spat in it his DNA in his saliva was going into the mud and he put it on the guy's eyes I mean was that part of what was going on the recreative miracle of the man that went and washed in the pool of Siloam and then he could see again God recreated his eyes and then God breathed into him Right, the Hebrew word there is ruach. Ruach. The Hebrew, even the Hebrew word itself sounds like wind. Ruach. Right? It's breath. God put his breath into man. We are three parts. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, spirit, soul, and body. We're three parts. We are, we are a tripart being. We have three parts. In the same way, we have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We have faith, hope, and love. We are three parts. When God breathed into the dust, man became living. Boom! All right? We came alive. All right? And we have our body full of the blood, the bones, the marrow, the DNA, the brain. Not all your memory is in your brain. What? Not all your memory is in your brain. Why do I know that? Because when you die, your brain stays in the ground, but yet in heaven you know people. So memory, our memory is in our spirit and our soul, probably in our spirit. Our human spirit is where a lot of our memory is. It's not just a physical organ. It is. Our brain's involved in memory, but there's more to it. We have a human spirit. What does our human spirit do? Job tells us it's through our human spirit we have revelation of God. That's how we know things. It's in your human spirit that you have an aha moment. When you understand the spiritual truth and you go, oh, that's spiritual. That's not your brain. Then your soul takes over. God tells you something and you go, oh, wow, I get it. Then your, then your soul takes over, which is your mind, your intellect, and your reasoning. And you start to reason things. Okay, inside your spirit you have creativity. 
uh, your sexuality is in your human spirit. This is why you can't change it. It's in you. Your, your, your gender, your sexuality is, is at the core of who you are. If you start to separate from who you are, you start to have division. Uh, intuition we know things how do we know things but we don't understand them you walk into a situation and you you just don't feel right your brain doesn't understand it but your intuition is going I'm not happy here or I meet someone and go I really like this person but I don't know why I've never met them before right that's intuition right how do you know you're dead well your human spirit leaves your body Jesus said that on the cross he said into your arms father I commit my spirit he breathed his last and he died so when your human spirit leaves your body goes back to God the breath that God gave you that's when we're dead and that's how people are raised back to life again the human spirit comes back to the body spirit leaves the person's dead the person prays the spirit come, human spirit comes back and they're alive again and I need to finish on this uh, there is so much we could teach on this, right? There is so much, so much. So you've got some notes there, so you can look over them through the week, look at some of the, the verses I've got there for the week. It will not be a waste of time to try and think through what goes on in your human soul, your spirit. Paul talks about this in Romans 7. You can read about it in Romans 7. Um, but let me just finish with this. You can go 10 more minutes if you need to. Okay. I've been given 10 minutes. Do you want 10 minutes? Okay, good. If you want to throw cabbages, I'll get off. You know, it's all right. <laughs> okay, so um, let's talk about free will. So when I've been praying over this summer, Lord, what do you want me to talk about? I've thought a lot about free will. So let's just get to that part in Genesis. So verse 19, uh, it goes through God is in the, the rivers and Eden. Uh, verse 15, he, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and take care of it. Uh, that has a, a, an aspect of worship there. The Hebrew there is to, to serve. Um, the Lord God commanded the man, you are, to, uh, you, are, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. So, you know, why on earth did God put something in the Garden of Eden that potentially uh, puts us in the, in the place of where we are today, right? The fall, right? Well, I think it's to do with free will. This is my opinion. And, and this is my considered opinion over the summer. It's free will. So um, it allows us to choose. You will find in the Bible a lot uh, passages that say, if you, if you choose to make the most high your dwelling place, then I will protect you, says the Lord. It's a free will choice. And so God put into the, into the garden free will that we could choose to be obedient to God or choose not to and and that's love he could if he had made us just robots to do everything he wanted us to do we don't have a choice but we all have a choice we now have a, 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 the, the ability to choose everything almost everything I mean I have to sign things at my workplace, which are kind of like, you know, I sign that, you know. I don't really have a, a, cho a choice, really, unless I want to leave my job, right? And it's okay, but most things, I choose to get out of bed in the morning, that's free will. Um, what I did at school by not paying attention affects me today. What I didn't learn at school because I mucked about, for instance, was a free will choice. Well, that impacts me today. Adam and Eve had a free will choice to obey God. You know, God said to them, don't eat from this tree. When you do, you will die. They had a free will choice. That's love, right? That's perfect love. You and I have a choice to love God. 
or we can choose not to. You and I have a choice to believe God's word, right? I don't think Jesus twists my arm to, to believe the word of God. Now, he might put pressure on me, but he's not forcing me to believe, to believe it. Do you see what I'm saying here? It's love. And this is how God is so patient with all of us, right? He's so patient because he waits for us to choose what is right. It's a free will choice. So let's just finish chap- chapter 2. Um, so right at near the end it says, But for Adam no suitable helper was found, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, closed up the place with, the f- with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. So he, God took the DNA out of man. Right? Man is created woman is created out of man uh, and God fashions woman I mean how did he do this did he have a, like a 3d DNA printing machine I don't know you know you've seen it in movies where they kind of build someone with a with a machine but no this is God he took part of Adam part of the you know, the man from the ground and made woman <laughs> and I always love this because uh, you know the it, it says down a little bit further uh, and he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man right so here's adam none of the animals really did it for him right he named all the animals extraordinary intellect go home tonight and say to one another name as many african animals as you can and then say to to your friend name as many uh different types of birds as you can you will quickly realize that wow we 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 run out nine or ten animals you will find yourself struggling Adam had an incredible intellect. He hadn't fallen, had he? He had an amazing brain. So God brings the woman to Adam. I think Adam went something like, shut up. (laughs) And the Holy Spirit edited that out. I don't think we'll put that in. We'll just take that out. But I think Adam just was like, whoa, whoa. And he goes, now this is bone of my bones. And flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman for she was taken out of man and here Adam is naming himself it's only when he sees woman does he name himself man he knows now who he is he knows he's built for relationship with the woman right just extraordinary that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh so i've got my last picture there we go this is my wife and i on our wedding night and we became one flesh it's quoted in matthew mark corinthians and ephesians that verse from genesis and they all reference it as fact right jesus said have you not read from the beginning God created them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his parents and be joined. The Hebrew there is glued, glued to his wife. So if you're married, you are glued to your spouse. If you've had sexual intercourse, you are one flesh. Isn't that amazing? And it's a mystery. Paul said this is a mystery. You know, it's highly complex what God does. Um, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame isn't that beautiful that, that it was just this perfect place in, in Eden the man and the woman perfect harmony with God they were under God's covering right at this point the man and the woman they were, they were fulfilled with each other they were fulfilled with God isn't that what we yearn back for as Christians? That relationship back with Father, with Abba, Abba Father, Daddy God. You know, come, Lord, I want to get back to you. Okay. So um, I'll end with that. But um, so for next week. All right. So read Genesis three and four. Ponder these things. You know. I, one, some of the, one of the things I like doing, and I, I read my Bible, I listen to my Bible, 
is, is I will sit in my yard and just, just think. Spend time just talking to God, just praying, allowing God to minister to you, and just spending time with him. Not really doing anything. You can, you can go for a walk, but I, I enjoy just pondering these things, asking God those questions. You know, Lord, what about this? Why did you do that? Why the tree of life? I mean, really? Ponder these things. Know that God loves you. And then in this week, pray for the people in your table. You know, God knows who they are. You might not know their names by the end of tonight, but just pray for them. Pray for one another.